This morning we'd like to take a look at the 22nd chapter. Our text is found in the last two verses, 30 and 31. God is speaking to Ezekiel, and he said, And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land, that I should not destroy it. But I found none. Therefore have I poured out my indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompensed upon their heads, saith the Lord God. It seems that God is always seeking men. I can remember when I was a little boy walking past the post office, and out in front there was this swinging sign, and it had a picture of Uncle Sam, and his finger was pointing out, and no matter what direction you were coming from, the finger was pointing right at you. And it said, Uncle Sam needs you. And inside of the post office, there was a armed services recruitment center as they were seeking to recruit men for armed services. I think if I were capable and a cartoonist, I would draw a finger out of heaven, pointing one of those that points in any direction that you're coming from, always pointing right at you, and I would inscribe it, God wants you. God is calling for men and women today because there is a crisis, there is an emergency that exists, and God is seeking to conscript people at this time of national emergency into his service. God is, in its nature, plenteous in mercy. He is slow to wrath and slow to judgment. Now, how opposite this is of the concept that so many people have of God. They think that God is just waiting for you to make the slightest mistake so he can just bat you across the room and throw you into a heap and say, out, forever, banished. Not so. God is so patient. He is so long-suffering. He is so filled with mercies, compassions. He is so slow to judge. In fact, the last thing that God wants to do is to judge you for your sins. God is looking for every excuse not to judge. He's looking for any excuse not to judge. And in the case here in the history of Judah, where things had gotten so bad that he could not avoid judgment any longer, even yet God was seeking to avert judgment, looking for some man among them who would stand in this gap, who would fill up this hedge so that he would not have to judge, so that they might turn from their wickedness and turn to God in order that he would not have to bring his judgment upon them. But tragically, it said he could find none, and therefore the judgment had to come. Right up until the moment that the axe falls, God is crying, Turn ye, turn ye, for why will ye die, saith the Lord? Behold, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. God is crying for them to turn right up to the end because God doesn't want to judge. I think that in many ways I was probably a weak disciplinarian as a parent. I'm even weaker as a grandparent. <laughs> but I just hated having to punish my children. 
I used to offer them every opportunity to escape punishment. Say you're sorry. Please say you're sorry. <laughs> Any excuse so I wouldn't have to punish them. But there were times when they were rebellious, obdurate in their rebellion, and had to do it. But, oh, I didn't like to. That's, that's one part of parenting that I really disliked, that of discipline. Yet, I knew it was necessary, so I forced myself to do it. Disliking it the whole while. God, in a sense, is a poor disciplinarian. It seems like he hates to bring judgment. He gives so many opportunities to repent, so many opportunities to say you're sorry to turn from your wickedness. Over and over, God is just pleading. He's just looking for that excuse so that he doesn't have to bring judgment. But if a person continues in his way, hardening his heart against God, the day will come because God is righteous, his judgment must fall. As we look at the 22nd chapter here at the nation of Judah, in the city of Jerusalem, we find that it had come to a very deplorable state. The nation itself was thoroughly corrupted. The government leaders were corrupt. They were filled with greed and they were judging and governing according to their own self-interest. They were using their positions of authority to enrich themselves, taking bribes from the people and uh, catering to the wealth. They had become extremely dishonest and corrupt. Not only the government officials and leaders, but the priesthood have become thoroughly corrupted. Now, the priests were always intended to be God's representatives to the people. Actually, a priest had a twofold duty. Here you have a holy, righteous God, here you have sinful man. And because of man's sin, his inability to approach the holy, righteous God. And so the priesthood was established so that he could take the sacrifices of the sinful man and offer them before the holy God. Thus, he came before God to represent the people. And he stood as the people's representative before God. Because they could not approach him, he approached God for them. Then in turn, when he would come out from the temple, from the offering of the sacrifice before the Lord, he would then represent God to the people and he would encourage them and, and, and exhort them, the Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord cause his face to shine upon thee and give thee peace. Thy sins are forgiven representing God to the people. But the priesthood was corrupted. They were giving a false representation of God because the priest had begun to live after material things and thus they were really demonstrating the supremacy of the material over the spiritual, which is wrong. They had reversed things. The priest should always be demonstrating that the spiritual is more important than the material, but they were doing just the opposite because they had become materialist. 
because they had become interested in riches and in wealth and in material things. They were representing to the people the superiority of the material over the spiritual and thus the corrupted priesthood. They were seeking to interpret the Word of God to the people rather than just encouraging the people to believe the Word of God. Now people say there are always so many interpretations. Watch out for any interpretation of the Scripture. In fact, I don't encourage interpreting the Scripture. I encourage believing the Scriptures. Usually when we interpret, we're trying to tell you God didn't mean what He said. But you better believe that He meant what He said. The prophets were corrupted. They were speaking lies to the people. They were saying to the people, peace, peace, when war was right at their borders. They were saying, we will be victorious over the enemy. We will drive them back to Babylon when soon they're going to be destroyed by the enemy. They were saying to the people, a day of great prosperity as we loot the enemy. When in reality, all of their goods were soon to be taken from them and they were to be left destitute. They were lying. in the name of God to the people. Now as the result, of course, the people had no chance. The Bible says if the foundations are destroyed, who then can stand? When the foundations of government or of righteousness, the church, spokesmen for God, when they become corrupt, who then can stand? And no wonder we read this terrible indictment in chapter 22 against the people of the things that the people were doing. The lack of true spiritual guidance had led the people into a moral cesspool. Pornography, adultery, fornication, and even incest were being commonly practiced by the people. And the whole while, the false prophets were holding out a false hope to the people, and with this false sense of security, they felt no need for repentance. Don't worry, everything's going to be all right. We're on the verge of a new age, you know. It's going to be glorious and prosperous, you know. And the people didn't feel that urgency towards repentance. Finally, in desperation, God sought for a man, someone who would stand up for the truth, someone who would stand in that gap, someone who would fill up this hedge. You see, God is so merciful that even at this point, if they would repent and turn from their wickedness, God would deliver them and save them, even though they've gone this far down. God sought for a man to fill up the hedge. You see, the Bible teaches that God does put a hedge around his people, a hedge of protection. You remember when Satan had appeared before God and the subject of Job was brought up, Satan complained, but you've put a hedge around him. I can't get to him. This hedge of God's protection had been around the people, the nation, but now the hedge is breaking down and God is looking for someone to build up that hedge. There's come a tremendous gap between God and the people because of their immorality, because of their living, 
living after their flesh and the lust of their flesh, they had become alienated from God and they needed someone to stand in the gap. And so God said, I sought for a man among them who would fill up the hedge, who would stand in this gap. God was actually looking for intercessors, men who would intercede in prayer, men who would stand there before God in prayer and intercede for these people. But God said, I found none. Everyone seemed to have their own excuse. Well, I'm building a new house. Well, I'm planting a new vineyard. Well, I'm so busy, you have got to work two jobs in order to develop financial security. But all of these things that they were doing were soon to be destroyed. So what value? So you're building a new house. Within weeks, it's going to be destroyed by the Babylonians. So you're planting new vineyard. Within days it's going to be uprooted by the Babylonians. So you're setting aside for your security in the future. It's going to be all taken away and robbed by the Babylonians. All of these excuses that we, they were using were really of no real import because these very things they were seeking to do are the very things that are going to be taken from them in just such a short time. The folly of their excuses. The carnal man always seems to be more absorbed in what he's going to eat and what he's going to drink and what he's going to wear. Jesus said, after all of these things do the heathen seek, but you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. You see, it's a matter of priority. And God is seeking for men who will put God first in their lives and who will put the spiritual things first in their lives, knowing and believing that God will take care of the other things, that God will provide for the other things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. But the tragic story is that God declares, I found none, therefore... I poured out my wrath upon them. Oh, how tragic. I found none, therefore. Because no intercessors could be found. Because no one was there to build up the hedge or stand in the gap. Therefore, judgment had to fall. My indignation was poured out. The wrath of my fire came upon them and I had to destroy them all for the lack of an intercessor. You see, they had given to God absolutely no alternative. God had called, but they would not answer. He had warned, but they ignored him. He pleaded, but they mocked him. And being righteous, he must now act. He has no excuse. Being righteous, he must judge. Having given to them all of the warnings and pleadings that he could, there remains now nothing more but that certain fearful looking forward to the wrath of God that is going to be poured out against his adversaries. You see, you can take one step too far. God calls, God calls, God calls to repent, to turn, to turn. You go on, you go on, you go on. You leave God absolutely no choice. Though God is slow to judge, plenteous in mercy, you violate that mercy of God. You do despite to that spirit of grace. And you leave God absolutely no alternative. He must judge you. 
Proverbs 29, 1 says, Behold, he who hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. The day of judgment will come swiftly. Suddenly you'll be wiped out and no remedy, and you'll face an eternity apart from God because you determined that you would not surrender those things of your flesh unto him. Oh, how God had desperately sought for a man. But he could find none. We saw the case of Moses. God was seeking for a man to lead his people out of the bondage in Egypt. He spoke to Moses out of the burning bush. Moses said, Lord, if I go there, they, and I tell them that you have sent me, they are, they'll say, God didn't send you. God didn't appear to you. So God took away that excuse. And he said, well, Lord, I'm not eloquent. I never have been eloquent. I'm slow to speech. and all. I can't do it, God. God took away that excuse. He said, oh, God, why don't you send someone else? what God had to go through to get a man. Over in Jerusalem, God was speaking to Jeremiah. He said, Jeremiah, before you were born, I knew you. While you were being formed in your mother's womb, I called you that you should stand before kings and proclaim my truth. Jeremiah says, oh, I can't do that, God. Uh, I'm, just, I'm just a lad. I'm, I'm just too young. They, they'll never listen to me. God was looking for a prophet to warn the Ninevites that destruction was coming. Jonah, go to Nineveh. <laughs> you know the story. He took off in the opposite direction the difficulty God has of getting hold of men to do his work. All he hears is a lot of lame excuses as they start running in the opposite direction. It's a wonder the work of God is ever accomplished inasmuch as he has chosen human instruments to do it. And today... God is looking for men and women for intercessory prayer that they might intercede because again the time of judgment has come and if we do not turn if we as a nation do not turn from this path of immorality and unrighteousness that we have chosen Believe me, I speak God's truth. God's judgment is going to fall upon our nation. God is seeking for men. God is seeking for women who will fill up the hedge, who will stand in the gap, who will stand for righteousness and stand for God, stand for purity and morality. They say history repeats itself. That's probably true because there are certain eternal principles. You see, times may change and conditions may change, science may change, technology may change, but there are certain principles or truth that don't change. Truth can't change. Truth remains. There are certain principles that God has established, and these principles hold throughout all generations. There is a principle that God declared in His Word. Righteousness exalts a nation. Sin is a reproach to any people. So we see a group of people band together and determined to seek God and to seek God's guidance upon them as a collective group of people. And they establish a government after God, 
upon the righteous principles of God. And we see that nation as it flourishes, as it is prospered, as it is blessed, as it grows, as it becomes strong and mighty. But then we see, unfortunately, in the strength and in the time of prosperity, the people begin to turn their eyes from God and on to the material things, and they begin to worship and serve the material blessings that they have received. And they become their gods, and they turn their backs upon God, and we see the deterioration that begins to take place until finally that nation is brought to oblivion and it's wiped out. And so we can look at history and we see it in nation after nation after nation. We see this repeated pattern of seeking God, prospering, being blessed, turning from God, and being destroyed. And we say, well, history repeats itself. Well, all you are doing is seeing the proof of a basic principle. You see it evidenced and proved by history. Now, we here in the United States are unfortunately in that particular place where Judah and Jerusalem were at the time that God was seeking for a man. We are living in a moral cesspool. Adultery, fornication, homosexuality, incest all around. Time magazine about three weeks ago had a horribly disgusting article where some of these weird freaks who pretend to be so intelligent and have their degrees in psychology were advocating incest as a perfectly helpful and beautiful practice encouraging the parents to have sexual relations with their children starting at the ages of two and three. I was appalled when I read that in a national magazine. So there are some queer, weird people advocating such a thing. That's no excuse to write it out in a national magazine. It's sick. We're living in a moral cesspool. We're at the end of the road. God is looking for an excuse not to judge. And he's seeking thus men and women to stand in the gap, to make up the hedge so that the ax will not have to fall. But God, I'm so busy. But God, why don't you ask someone else? But God, I'm, as soon as I'm through with this project, and we're offering all of these excuses to God, and in the meantime, the whole system is going under. And I sought for a man, God said among them, who would fill up the hedge, who would stand in the gap, and I found none, therefore have I poured out my indignation upon them. The therefore is always there. It's always when the lack of people to be responsive and obedient to God, therefore, judgment fell. Such is the story of history. Such is the demonstration of the absolute principles of God. God isn't speaking to the person sitting next to you. He's speaking to you. And he's calling you to intercession, to prayer, to commitment. Our survival is at stake. Shall we pray? O oh God, our Heavenly Father, help us that we shall be doers of the word and not hearers only. 
deceiving ourselves. May we, O oh God, respond to thy call and give ourselves to prayer, to intercession. God, help us that we will not be guilty of self-seeking, seeking glory or honor or credit to ourselves, but, O oh God, unto thee bring glory and unto thy name. And may we live, O oh God, for thy glory. In Jesus' name, amen. You can probably give a hundred excuses to God why he can't use you. Why he should ask someone else to do it. But the problem is, those others that he are asking are giving him a hundred and one excuses. And everyone disqualifies himself. And thus God is left. Without a man, without a woman. And the whole thing goes up down the tubes. God help us today to respond to the voice of God and to the need and to the challenge of the hour. I would encourage many of you men to get involved in that intercessory prayer ministry at night. I would encourage you ladies to get involved in the intercessory prayer groups during the day. It's not too late. Judgment can still be averted. If my people which are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and I will heal their land. God is so slow to judgment, but don't make the fatal mistake of mistaking his slowness to judgment as inability to judge because history proves that once it falls it's irretrievable God's looking for men God help you to respond Lord here am I use me send me God wants you Maybe you want to respond to him this morning. I'd encourage you to go back to the prayer room. There, just respond to God. Maybe you haven't been certain. Maybe, maybe this has a personal application. Maybe you're about the end of the road as far as God's mercy is in your own particular life. God's been calling. You've been running. God's been over and over reaching out to you, but you've been turning away from him, following your own folly and your own lust. And it could be that the axe of judgment is about ready to fall personally in your own life. You're about ready to be cut off. And this could be, to many of you, God's final call. Someday you will hear God's final call of love to receive his offer of salvation. And this could be it. Think about it. Dare you disregard the voice of God? Can you do it forever? No, you can't. These are serious days. And God is looking for men to make that commitment to him. Women to make that commitment of themselves to him. God bless you and cause you to abound in the work of the Lord. Serving him. Giving to him your capacities. as full or as lacking as they may be. God doesn't require more from you.
than what you can give. Never. God bless. And may his message burn in our hearts. For Jesus' sake.